Hello everyone and thanks very much for tuning in to today's webinar. As you may have already read in the Eventbrite link, today's webinar is about quantum computing, the era of quantum advantage. I'm James Galvin and I'm the Marketing Communications Officer for Archer Materials. Our two panellists, as you can probably see on your screen, um, are to today are Dr. Martin Fuchsley, the Quantum Technology Manager for Archer Materials, and Dr. Adam Maruka, Makaruka, sorry, an AI practitioner and IBM Q ambassador for IBM. I'll just briefly run through their bios. Dr. Martin Fuchsley is an honorary associate of the University of Sydney. He has 10 years experience in building quantum computing devices and technology. During his postdoctoral research at the University Center, University of New South Wales Center for Quantum Computing and Communication Technology, he developed the single atom transistor. Martin was awarded the AIP Bragg Gold Medal for most outstanding physics PhD in Australia for his thesis. Dr. Adam Makaruka is a data scientist and IBM Q ambassador within IBM Systems, where he's developing deep learning cases and demonstrations for clients on IBM's deep learning platform. He completed his postdoctorate at IBM Research Australia in 2018, where he worked on deep learning applications for the financial services industry. Adam has more than eight years experience in using and setting up high performance computing environments. Now I'll just quickly run through a few ground rules for the webinar before we begin. Today's webinar will have a Q&A session at the end. However, you can submit questions during the webinar to be answered at the end. You will get, there should be a bottom, uh, little button down the bottom of the screen with the Q&A um, where you can submit these questions. Due to limited time and the high number of attendees we have, we may not get to every question, so I hope you can understand. If you do have additional questions, um, feel free to flick them through to the hello at ArcherX email box, um, and we'll endeavor to get them answered for you. Um, and now I'll um, pass it over to Adam to present first. Excellent, thanks for that introduction. I'll just bring up my slides. All right, I'll just confirm you can see the slide there. Excellent. So, uh, yeah, as introduced, I'm Dr. Adam Makaruka. I'm an AI practitioner at IBM Q Ambassador. Um, one of my roles is to talk about and evangelize uh, quantum computing, particularly IBM's quantum computing uh, technology. And in this session, I'll give you a bit of an intro into what quantum computing is, uh, what types of problems it should solve or help to solve, and, and what IBM is doing in this space, what hardware we're building what software we're designing so that we can enable uh, quantum information scientists to build and design new algorithms. So I want you to think about a quantum computer. It's, it's kind of like a big supercomputer. It, it promises to be faster and more powerful. Um, but let's start at what our current generation of supercomputers do and solve. So I've, I've worked on supercomputers for much of my research life. Uh, and they solve problems like weather modeling, machine learning, AI, um, and drug design and discovery. And in fact, the uh, quantum computer, uh, the supercomputer here, one of the world's most powerful systems known as the Summit Supercomputer, located out at Oak Ridge National Laboratories in the US, is in fact doing drug discovery to help combat uh, the novel coronavirus. And drug discovery is one of the use cases that we see on supercomputers all over the world. Uh, one of the highest, use, uh, highest um, compute use cases that are on these machines. Uh, and we design drugs on computers because designing them in real life costs lots of money and takes a lot of time. It's hundreds of millions of dollars to test and design a new drug to combat a new disease or virus. So we design it computationally because that get way we can test thousands, sometimes millions of drugs against different targets. But the challenge is if we increase the size of the drug or the complexity of the virus or the um, uh, macromolecule or the protein that we're testing against, we actually massively in, in, increase the number of the amount of compute we need to the point that even the current generations of, of um, supercomputers can't solve those problems. So we make decisions about simplifying these uh, models to allow us to run them on these, these um, machines that we have today. And by simplifying them, we actually make them less accurate 
And then these drugs don't necessarily always work. And instead of getting maybe two or three good candidates, we get 50 or 60 good candidates. Uh, and, and this is a challenge. So what we'd ideally do is not have to sacrifice accuracy and be able to run um, these drugs on um, uh, uh, with their full accuracy with no compromises. But, uh, and we, we just can't do that on this generation of supercomputers. And these problems are intractable. Uh, and here's an example. If we were to try and model uh, something like penicillin and an antibiotic and to help us design a new type of antibiotic, well, we'd need more classical bits, the fundamental computing unit, than there are atoms in the known universe. That would mean we'd have to build a supercomputer that used all of the atoms in the universe. Like, clearly impossible. Um, but with a quantum computer, if we used um, qubits, so the quantum analog two bits, well, we'd only need 286 qubits. It's actually reasonable and something that we're not too far off. We're at 50 or slightly over 50 qubits at the moment. So we could soon see that we could run penicillin, um, something that would be impossible otherwise, with full accuracy on a quantum computer in the near future. This would help design new drugs, new novel, novel drugs. But we can't only just do chemistry. There's a whole range of other problems that we see quantum computers useful for. Complex scenario simulations, where we can increase the number of uh, simulations with higher quality samples, much uh, larger degrees of freedom as input. We can maybe apply it to things like machine learning and AI to increase the complexity of the input data or the complexity of the models. And optimization. Um, route optimization is one example where we're taking, um, uh, working with automotive industries um, and trying to optimize where you might send a vehicle, um, so to minimize the amount of driver would have to drive and reduce the lead time to um, the pickup of the, of the passenger. Another example of optimization tasks that I thought might resonate with the, the crowd is around portfolio optimization. So in a portfolio, you have a bunch of assets and you're trying to you're trying to solve uh, two problems. You're trying to minimize the risk that's in that portfolio and maximize the profit. And you do this by optimizing the percentage of how much asset you hold. Now, you will see that most managed funds typically have um, numbers of uh, assets under 200. And that's because optimizing, uh, optimizing um, any portfolio with more than 200 assets is actually really challenging computationally impossible to do in some cases. So, uh, but, but with a quantum computer, you could potentially increase the um, assets in that portfolio to hundreds more or even thousands. And that would give us a, a more diverse portfolio, which should lower the risk, but also potentially increase the profit. So these types of problems is where we see quantum computers is, uh, being useful. And, uh, they have a, uh, they, uh, um, the problems I've described and the use cases I've described use a set of mathematics and tools and te techniques that applied across different domains and, and uh, fields. And so we see quantum computers solving a range of problems in all sorts of different fields. But what they are going to specifically be used for is hard problems. They are like a supercomputer. You're not going to, going to use a quantum computer to write up a um, Word document or build up a slide deck. That's just not what they're used for. They are designed specifically to solve hard problems. And the reason they can work and solve these hard problems is because they are based on a fundamentally different uh, operating procedure to our classical machines. And I say classical because our standard machines, our laptop, our phone, our current generation of supercomputers are based around the idea of classical physics. Whereas a quantum computer, obviously it's in the name, is based on quantum physics. And this has different behavior that allows these um, machines to actually perform differently and to, as the number of qubits grow, to grow exponentially in the amounts they can compute. And so uh, one of our researchers, uh, Jay Gambetta, likes to say you're thinking too classically. And he likes to say this because we have to think differently about how we design the algorithms that run on these machines. We can't just take a classical algorithm and run it on a quantum computer. 
We have to design it differently. And so it is a fundamental change. And one of the fundamental differences is the unit of computation that we use. In a standard computer, a classical machine, we have a classical bit and it has a state of zero or one. In a qubit, uh, in a quantum computer, we have a quantum analog called a qubit. A qubit has a state of zero or one as well, but it also has, uh, when it's running, a combination of that zero and one state. And I want to give you an uh, analogy to, to make this a little bit more understandable. Let's consider a bit as a coin. Uh, if you have that uh, coin on the table, let's say heads is facing up, that's in state zero, it's a zero state. If we turn that coin over on the table, it's now in state one uh, and, and it'd be a tail. So that's what we call, that's a classical bit. You just have one or the other. Whereas in a quantum computer, well, that coin, we're about to flip it. We put it on our, my thumb and we're about to flick it up into the air. If it's facing up, it's a head, then it's state zero before. If we turn it over and put it on my thumb and it's a, a tail facing up, then it's the state one. What we, do, we, what we do is then we flip it, spinning in the air when it lands, it's a head or it's a tail, depending on what it lands on. But when it's in the air, it's, is it a head or is it a tail? It's, it's kind of some combination of both zero and one. And when we're running a quantum computer, that's what happens with the qubit. It's kind of some combination of the zero and one state. It's not one or the other, um, but a quantum computer runs very similar to flipping a coin, is that when it lands on a result, it could be a head or it could be a tail, it could be a zero or it could be a one, it's probabilistic. And so with a coin flip, we'll, we'll uh, you know, to get the right probability distribution, we'll flip the coin maybe a thousand times. We'll get 500, and five, 500 tails, 500 heads, or thereabout. And that distribution tells us what's most, the most likely outcome. When we run a quantum computer, same idea. We have to run the computation 1,000 times so that the qubit will land on the right or the most likely outcome. We'll get a distribution and the most often outcome is the, the, the true result. So it's probabilistic in nature, which makes it very different to classical machines. And so these things manifest themselves in quantum physics behaviors. So there's this idea of superposition. That's that idea that um, the state of a qubit can be in a combination of zero and one. So that's the coin as it's flipping. That's the qubit in computation. And as it's flipping, well, we can actually run, you know, say flip hundreds of coins and there's be hundreds of qubits and get them all to interact and it'll bias the probability that they then land on. So it's more likely to land on heads or tails um, and or more likely to land on zero or ones. And by biasing this probability, that's how we can actually influence the computation and get a result that's meaningful. And when we measure it, we force it into one of these states and that's probabilistic and we just run it many times to get the most likely outcome. And the way we bias that coin or the qubit in motion is via another set of quantum behaviors. In interference is one, entanglements another, and then we have a set of quantum gates that allow us to design algorithms that influence um, these qubits. And this is how we can then use these quantum computers for something meaningful, for quantum chemistry, for optimization of your portfolio. Now, this is a, a very different way of operating. And so we actually need PhDs, scientists, users to actually go and design these new algorithms because it's challenging. But if we can design them well, the benefit is that a quantum computer scales exponentially as we add qubits. So if we have one qubit, we have two quantum states. If we have two qubits, we have four quantum states. And if we have three qubits, we have eight quantum states. Whereas if we had one bit, we'd only have one state. If we had two bits, we'd only have two states. If we had three bits, uh, we'd only have three states. So you can see the quantum computer grows exponentially as we add qubits. So when we get to this number of 275 qubits, well, we have so many quantum states that we have you know, more quantum states than there are atoms in the observable universe, which means we could never design a normal classical computer that could actually beat this machine. And that's the exciting thing. That's where the potential of quantum computers come from. And that's why there's so much excitement about them. But we're still early days, we're getting there. And we're on the road 
quantum advantage. This is where we see quantum computers having a real commercial outcome and solve real world problems. Uh, and, and we think we're gonna be there in the next few years. Um, we're measuring our progress using this um, concept called quantum volume. And quantum volume is the combination of not just the number of qubits, but how high quality those qubits are. So if I design a qubit and it's got a very high error rate, well, these things are probabilistic. So then I'll, I could run it a million times and I would just get garbage out. So I need really high, qubit, high quality qubits to get any good result. And what we see is if we don't even increase the number of qubits, we just decrease the error rate in the existing qubits we have, we can drastically increase the quantum volume, which means that they're much more useful and they will be um, applicable to much, uh, much more problems. And so what we're starting to see is that we are doubling the quantum volume every year. And we're on this, this trend line right now. Uh, and so if we keep on track uh, on this trend, we think in the next three, four, five years, we will have a quantum advantage and we'll see quantum computers actually solve real commercial problems. So it's all good to talk about in theory what these quantum computers are, but let's see one in reality. This is IBM's quantum computer. And it's based on superconducting technology. We call it superconducting qubits. And we have a legacy in building computer chips in silicon. And we have used that IP to design these quantum computers. And we think uh, we're at the top of the game in, in designing quantum computers. Uh, and what's unique uh, and what's interesting about superconducting qubits is that they run at an extremely low temperature, 15 millikelvin. Uh, and that is um, lower than the temperature of space. So this is, this is really cold. We've got a bunch of insulation and coolant to keep them that cold. And we have some of the world's most powerful computer, quantum computers. And the exciting thing about these ones is that you can actually go and use them today. We have an online platform for researchers, scientists, and anybody who's interested to jump on and actually experience and use a real quantum system with our software. And that's called the IBM Q experience. So you can go in there and design your own quantum algorithms. And we have a free tier and premium tier, and you can just go and log in today and actually real, use a real quantum computer. And we have some simple online graphical tools to allow you to design algorithms. Um, if you're not a quantum scientist, you might know what you're doing, uh, but that's okay, because we have lots of teaching material on there as well, so you can learn. Uh, but what underpins all of this is our open source Qiskit software stack based on uh, Python. And it basically provides a set of tools to interact with the hardware level and then to allow you to test your algorithms, um, both on simulators and real hardware, as well as um, to fundamentally understand how to characterize and mitigate the errors that uh, occur. And then a framework on top of that to build high level libraries that other users don't need to understand the quantum algorithms can actually leverage for things like optimization, machine learning, or um, quantum chemistry. And what's really cool about this platform is it's actually hardware agnostic. Anybody who designs any quantum hardware can actually leverage this software stack to allow their users to build algorithms that will run on any hardware. And it's all open source. And we have a big um, community around this. You can log on to our GitHub page, check out our, um, our software, um, and actually get involved in the community, which we're building out um, that, of, of users. And we've just run our summer school that had over a thousand attendees. Uh, and we have massive events worldwide where we engage and encourage users to getting involved in developing on our hardware and developing with Qiskit, our software stack. And then we have the IBM Q network, which is how we engage with commercial entities, startups and research organizations. Um, and here in Australia, we have, and, oh, there we go. Sorry, my uh, slide X slowing up. Um, so here in Australia, we have a few startups connected with the IBM network. Um, Arch Materials being one of those. 
and uh, we have our research partner in the uh, quantum hub here in Australia, which is the University of Melbourne, located in Victoria. And I think uh, this is where I'm going to close out, and I'm, I want you to um, realize that uh, quantum computing is really exciting. We're early days, but we're making really good progress, and you can actually access real hardware today and actually get involved. And I encourage you, if you have any interest, get involved, have a look on the IBM Q experience and start playing around with a real quantum computer today. So thank you for your time and I'll pass over to Mark. Well, um, thank you, Adam, for this uh, interesting talk and for introducing the IBM Q network. Hi, everybody. My uh, name is Martin Fuchsler, and I'm the manager of quantum technology here at Arch Materials. So um, this is Arch's part of the presentation. And I just want to say uh, thanks for taking the time this morning uh, to be part of this webinar. I'm definitely very excited to tell you about some of the quantum technology that we're developing here at Arch. Uh, just uh, quickly before we begin this talk, a reminder that this is an informative presentation, so it's by no means any form of investment advice, but more importantly, and at Archive, we're always quite proud to say that, unless it's otherwise stated, all the images, all the photos that you see, they're our own. So they're our people in the labs, uh, they're our materials, and they're our data. Now, because uh, many of you in the audience today will have an investment background, let me just give you a very quick snapshot of our company. So Archer has been listed on the ASX for over a decade now, and you can see uh, on the top there our uh, stock ticker. Now all this is uh, publicly available information, but one thing that I wanna just point out that following a recent capital raise, uh, we have over $8 million in the bank and we have no corporate debt. So we're truly in a healthy position to uh, drive forward this technology development over the coming years. And for those of you that are interested, please uh, visit our website, the link's down there, for more details. So Archer is a materials technology company, and our aim is to develop innovative technology in several areas, um, in quantum computation, in human health, and in reliable energy. And today's presentation is entirely focused around our quantum technology. So we already learned from uh, Adam talk just then, quantum computation or quantum technology can get uh, quite technical sometimes, uh, but I just want to point out that this is not meant to be a deeply technical presentation. So it's rather a high level overview of the technology we're developing so you understand what makes our proposition at Archer so exciting. So for today, there's two things that I want you to take away from this talk, and I'll go into more details on those in this presentation. First, I'm going to give you an overview of our technology and its development towards a quantum computing processor, which we dubbed one to cq and I will also tell you where this technology fits into the wider quantum computing ecosystem so you understand where the value of our proposition comes from. And secondly, I will give you more details on our engagement with the IBM Q network and how we intend to use IBM's quantum software platform, Qiskit, that Adam has already introduced for our own chip technology. So this image on the top uh, will look familiar. Uh, so before I tell you about Arches quantum technology, let's just again take a step back just for a moment and look at computing at computers as a whole. So one thing again, we've already learned this morning from Adam's talk that quantum computing is fundamentally different from a traditional or what we call a uh, classical computer. But despite those fundamental differences, there are definitely parallels between both technologies, classical and quantum. And I think it's quite instructive to, to point those out. So. If you think about a classical computer, most people will think of a desktop PC or, or a laptop. Um, but of course, we all know, and we've just seen that, there are much more powerful, powerful machines out there. So again, here's an image of the IBM uh, Summit supercomputer. Now, this machine, as, as we just learned, is extremely powerful. But uh, you can also see that this thing is as big as a warehouse, which obviously uh, means it's quite limited in ownership. So the important point here is that classical computing devices run the whole spectrum from such powerful supercomputers on the one hand down to portable, de portable devices such as your laptop or even your mobile phone. And the same is expected to hold true for quantum computing as well. So 
if you look at the image on the bottom, that's just an example of a commercially available, very early stage quantum computer, which just like a supercomputer is bulky and it's expensive. Uh, and again, that sets limitations on its ownership and use. And at the moment, quantum computers in general are still at a very, very early stage. And in general, they're still bulky and expensive. And one of the main reasons uh, why quantum computers are so bulky is because they rely on extreme cooling of their quantum hardware. I mean, we just, we just heard these quantum computers are cooled, the hardware is cooled to temperatures lower than uh, the temperature in space, so wow. <laughs> uh, and what you see in that uh, lower photo of the quantum computer, the, the bulk uh, that's associated with it is actually mostly the cooling equipment rather than the quantum processor chip itself. So looking at this bulky quantum computer and, and going back to our analogy with classical computers, the obvious question is, well, what about mobile devices in the future? What about consumer devices? Well, there's obviously gonna be a demand for more computational power in those devices as well. I mean, if you don't believe me, just, just think about what your phone can do today and compare that to what your phone could do 15 years ago. And quantum computation in many ways represents the future of powerful com computing. So of course there will be demand for uh, quantum enabled consumer devices. And this is where Archer comes in because we offer a technology that has the potential for operation at room temperature, which does not require extreme cooling and which allows uh, for easy integration with existing electronic devices. And there's a huge opportunity in this because enabling quantum functionality, not just in these large, bulky, expensive systems, but in portable consumer devices would greatly accelerate the adoption of quantum technology as a whole. Now this slide may look familiar if you think back 15 minutes ago. Uh, what Adam said, so before I give you more details about, about our, about Arches quantum technology, let me just spend one quick slide on what a qubit really is because in order to understand quantum computing, uh, you really need to understand qubits. And only if you understand the limitations of other qubit systems, only then can you really appreciate what makes our technology so promising. Now, don't worry. Uh, again, uh, I won't get very deep, deeply technical or into any mathematical definitions. So instead, let me give you an analogy, which again, uh, we already heard of this morning in the IBM talk. So, um, and that's illustrated by the image on the right-hand side there. So in a classical computer, and I'm just repeating what was already said this morning, information is represented by bits. Uh, these bits are binary, which means they have only two states. They can either be zero or one, or if we use the analogy of a coin, uh, they can be heads or tails. And a quantum computer, on the other hand, uses quantum mechanical states to represent information. These quantum bits or qubits can be both heads and tails at the same time. And that, as Adam already said, is something we refer to as superposition, which is uh, illustrated by the image on the bottom where you can see the coin as both heads and tails at the same time. Um, and it's because you exploit quantum mechanical properties such as superposition is that a quantum computer is much more powerful than a classical computer for certain tasks. So the question is, if these qubits are so powerful and so great, why haven't we built a, a quantum computer a long time ago? Well, it turns out that these qubits are extremely sensitive, extremely fragile. So any form of disturbance, any, any perturbation, any interaction with the environment destroys uh, the quantum state and all the quantum information that's stored in that qubit is lost. So these destructive disturbances, they include light, they include heat, electromagnetic radiation, but very importantly, they also include interactions within the qubit material itself. And a common solution, as we already heard, is uh, to overcome this problem uh, and to minimize all those types of interactions is to cool your qubits down to extremely low temperatures, close to the absolute temperature zero at minus 273 degrees Celsius. And it's this need for extreme cooling, as I've already pointed out, that makes many quantum computers so big and bulky, which again, in turn, represents a huge barrier for the widespread use, particularly mobile devices. And the important thing here, and what I want you to take away from this slide, is that the exact mechanisms that cause that destructive interference and that in a way limit a qubit's robustness are different for every qubit system uh, because they're intrinsically determined by the physical characteristics of the qubit material that you use. And the reason this is important is because the material at the core of Arches quantum technology does not require uh, these ultra low temperatures and it, instead it has the proven potential to allow for quantum operations at room temperature. So, 
let me finally tell you a bit more about our material. Somebody actually pointed out just la last week that that looks a bit like um, rice puffs. I don't think so, but what you see in the image uh, on the left-hand side here is an electron microscope image at very high magnification, and that shows the base material of Arches qubits. So it's a synthetic carbon-based nanomaterial, which comes in the form of a powder, and this powder is made up of uh, these tiny spheres. So in this image, you can see thousands of those spheres, and each one has a diameter of about 35 nanometers. So just a reminder, a nanometer is a millionth of a millimeter. So in other words, these spheres are over 1,000 times smaller than the width of a human hair. So they're really quite small, but importantly, they're still large enough that we can position individual ones on a surface to make a working qubit device. Now, this material has some very interesting properties and I will bring up a, a scientific looking graph here. I don't have to go into the exact details, but what this graph shows is unambiguous proof that you can coherently control the quantum states in this material. This graph shows data that has been measured on Arches materials, so just that material you see on the background image, and it has been published in a high ranking and a reputable scientific uh, journal. So, and that means it has undergone a rigorous peer review process. So the most important thing about this data though is this data was taken at room temperature. Again, without going into the details, the thing to know is that these types of oscillations that you can see in this graph can be measured for any other type of qubit systems. And usually, again, at low temperature. And the fact that we have already measured it for our material and at room temperature is direct proof that it really has the potential to allow for quantum information processing at room temperature. So the take home point from the slide is that the material at the core of arches of our quantum technology, it's easily made. It's easily processed, and in contrast to most other qubit systems, uh, that it has a proven potential to enable quantum operations at room temperature. So it circumvents uh, the cumbersome need for extreme cooling, which burdens so many other qubit systems. Now, uh, the data in this graph I just showed you on the last slide was taken on a bulk quantity, which means it's trillions and trillions of those nanospheres. And a key part of the development is to be able to repeat this type of measurement, not for a bulk quantity, but just for a single one of these nanospheres, because it's the single nanospheres uh, that define the qubits in our system. And this slide gives you a summary of our technology development towards this goal, towards a viable qubit processor over the past 12 months. This slide uh, may look a bit more technical, a bit busy, but uh, just bear with me and I'll walk you through it. So let me first explain a few important points which are summarized uh, by the bullet points on the left. So the first thing I want to emphasize is that this is not a garage job. It's not something you do in your garage or just on a workbench. This is cutting edge technology that requires access to chip foundries, to specialized nanofabrication labs, and to state-of-the-art in, uh, instrumentation. And at Archer, we have access to all those types of facilities through our access agreements and through collaborations and partnerships both here and uh, overseas. And this really allows us to develop the technology towards a working prototype. And another important thing to mention is that the IP for our technology is protected and Archer has the exclusive rights to develop and to commercialize that IP. So we filed a patent application in the most relevant countries and this patent application is currently undergoing prosecution in all these jurisdictions. So if we now look uh, on the images, at the images on the right, uh, these are all taken from ASX announcement over the past 12 months. And as, I, as I've said before, our work really is focused on going from, from the bulk material we just saw in the last slide towards a working qubit device. So if you, for example, I just want to point one out, look at the image uh, on the top left, the little white arrow indicates a single nanosphere, or in other words, a single qubit component, which we were able to isolate and position with nanometer accuracy on a substrate. So, all these images you can see here just give you a few glimpses of important steps along our technical development roadmap that we've achieved so far. And for those of you that are interested, please feel free to uh, download the relevant ASX announcements from our website. And I also want to mention we've given a webinar in uh, April this year where we had more time and uh, we went into much more technical details. So if you're interested, please feel free to watch that online. You can find it on YouTube. One thing that I do want to highlight though uh, is just the image on the bottom right. And this shows part of a quantum control device that we have developed in collaboration with the University of New South Wales here in Sydney. And the aim of this device is to be able to control and to measure 
the quantum state uh, on first a few hundred and eventually a single carbon nanosphere, or in other words, on a single qubit. Now, these measurements will happen over the coming months and there will be another key validation of the technology and also of our commercial uh, viability of, of Arches quantum project. Again, I won't go into the technical details of those quantum control measurements, but one thing, that's, one thing that's important to realize is that these measurements, these types of measurements, require very elaborate and precisely tuned electromagnetic pulses and voltages in order for them to work. And, and these types of pulses, in turn, need to be controlled by highly specialized software. Uh, and that's particularly true when you're not just thinking about one, but uh, devices with multiple, many qubits on them. And this is really one of the key focal points of our engagement with IBM's Q network. So for those of you that have been following Archer's story, that have been following us for a while, you will know that uh, Archer joined the global IBM Q network in May this year. And I just wanna dedicate this last slide uh, to give you some more information about uh, what this engagement with IBM looks like. So much of what I've talked about so far has been very focused uh, on quantum hardware because this is where our domain expertise is here at Archer. But now we'll shift gears and we'll talk about quantum software. Now, again, Adam in the first part of this webinar has already done a great job of uh, introducing the IBM Q network as well as uh, their quantum development software called Kiskit. So I don't have to say too much about what it can do, but it will give you some points on what the benefits are uh, to Archer for using Kiskit. So at Archer, at the moment, we're still at an early stage in our hardware development, but as we further progress along our technical roadmap, quantum control software, software will soon become relevant. And I've already hinted at that as an example in the last slide, uh, where we'll need specialized software to enable the quantum control measurements for single qubits and in the future on multiple qubits. And Qiskit, uh, as a software platform, is designed to do exactly that. So to enable quantum control at the hardware level. And the image, you've seen this before, uh, on the left-hand side there, is uh, again uh, what Qiskit looks like for, for an end user, uh, the, the back end of Qiskit. We have programming code on one side, and uh, you also have graphical representation of a uh, quantum algorithm that you run. Uh, Qiskit is already widely used in the community, and it's hardware agnostic, as Adam said, meaning that uh, it really can run on a variety of different types of qubit systems. And that's why we believe at Archer, it's the right tool for the job. So in a sense, we believe our collaboration with IBM is a great example of Qiskit's flexibility. And we believe that by integrating it with Archer's one to c 2 cq technology, uh, we'll ultimately be able to enable practical com quantum computing applications for widespread use. So uh, I also want to mention that as part of our forward thinking strategy here at Archer, we're actually in the process of bringing this expertise in house by hiring a dedicated Qiskit quantum algorithm developer. And uh, we're very much looking forward to further engage and contribute to the Q network in the future. And this already brings us to the end of this webinar of Archer's part. So I hope you enjoyed this talk and I hope it was able to convey to you some of the excitement that we have for the technology uh, here at Archer. So for more information, James already said that, please check our, our webpage and uh, you can subscribe to the newsletter. And with this, I say thank you for listening. And now I think it's time to answer your questions. So back to you, James. Excellent. Thank you very much, Martin and Adam. Um, perfect. Now, I, I um, was graced with a lot of questions through to my emails this morning. So some of these won't be in the, um, the Zoom chat. Um, so I'll just quickly open some of these up. Uh, the first question, which I should have actually mentioned prior to this is, um, will the webinar be recorded? Yes, the um, webinar will be recorded. We're going to be posting it on the YouTube, our Archer YouTube channel. We'll also send out a link to the webinar to all of the emails that have registered through Eventbrite and Zoom. Um, okay, first technical question off the rank. Um, this is one that was submitted earlier. I think um, it'd be good to have both Adam and Martin answer this one. When I raise the subject of quantum computing in conversation with people, often they say any improvement or radical commercialization is 10 to 15 years down the track. What sort of time frame are we looking at for the development of quantum computing? I'll open this up to Martin, seeing as your mic's on, and then uh, Adam, maybe you can answer a second. Yeah, so the, the time frame is, of course, a key question. I'm sure Adam will agree. That's the question uh, you always get. And it's, it's not one, I mean, I, I wish I had, a, I had a date for you, give you a definite date at which we uh, achieve quantum advantage. 
I don't want to uh, stray too far, but I think it's, it's important to give you a bit of a background. So Google, for example, last year made a big splash uh, all over the news worldwide when they claimed uh, quantum supremacy. So they said they had performed a calculation on one of their quantum hardware uh, that would have taken the IBM Summit, that supercomputer we just saw, I think 10,000 years. Now, even though that may be true for that very, very specialized problem, uh, it doesn't mean that quantum computation is, is actually useful. And so IBM, and that's something that we appreciate at Archer, doesn't, has gone away from that term of quantum supremacy and calls it quantum advantage. So it really is more focused on when do you have a quantum computer or a quantum enabled device that really does something useful, like a real world problem, like for example, in drug uh, development. And so what we'll see is definitely a phasing in over the next, I'd say over the next decade. And it will really depend on, on what type of application you're looking at. So uh, you're not gonna see, uh, I'm, I'm just gonna venture out and I'm, I'm gonna say, you're not gonna see a quantum, a fully quantum enabled phone next year. But you will definitely see uh, for the big uh, players uh, or the, the early adopters, let's say, that can afford uh, expensive quantum hardware, uh, especially in the fields of, for example, drug de uh, development and pharmaceutical companies, we'll definitely see more and more of that technology being uptaken. And it's, it's, not, it's not a paradigm shift where you just go classical quantum, but instead you will slowly have, you know, you have, you have lots of modeling when it comes to uh, the development of, of drugs. And so you will have modeling and the quantum part will become more and more important. And I'd say a decade is uh, definitely until we see really that becoming the dominant a modeling mechanism is probably a good uh, time frame. So I don't know. Do you agree, uh, Adam? Yep. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think, um, like you suggested, we'll see uh, specific areas of focus, uh, see early success. Quantum chemistry is one example. Um, we've already got several papers out demonstrating that you can successfully run uh, quantum uh, algorithms or quantum chemistry algorithms on a quantum computer and get very accurate results on small molecules, things like hydrogen um, and lithium hydride. Uh, these sorts of simple algorithms and simple molecules are the early stage research. But I guess um, the point is that a quantum computer, because of its exponential growth in terms of the computational states, when we do start to see that um, uh, commercial gain or, or the point at which a quantum computer is very successful at solving some of these problems, they will, it will accelerate very quickly. Unlike a classical machine where we see a linear growth, we'll see that exponential growth. And that's where the excitement is. Even if it is 10 years off, when we hit that 10 year point and we start getting these gains, well, then we'll get uh, very fast gains where they will well outpace classical machines very quickly. Excellent. Yeah, and on, on that, Adam, Adam, I think there's a question here, I think that's with regard to uh, artificial intelligence. Um, will quantum compute, computing greatly assist autonomous vehicle, vehicles and artificial intelligence, and how, how so will it assist the, the industry? Yeah, so, I, I mean, uh, let's leave the AI side uh, 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 aside for a second. In sort of like um, autonomous vehicles, it's going to be used for optimization and routing. Uh, that's where the first use case will be. Um, adapting our current set of algorithms for AI and machine learning to a quantum computer is actually a really challenging problem. Uh, and what we're actually seeing is AI being used to assist the quantum computer to help mitigate the errors, to help control how it's run, um, rather than actually being used uh, to so, uh, run a quantum algorithm, uh, I'm sorry, an AI algorithm on top of quantum computer. Um, we see that as sort of like the you know 15 year span um, is it, that's something that's going to come down the track there might be early use cases where we see pattern matching and things like that um, being very useful on a quantum computer uh, on the on the early generation that we have currently um, but for ai and um, autonomous vehicles and things like that it's going to stay with our classical set of tools for the for the near term i'd say and uh, Martin, a question here for you. In the coming months, with the measurement of the control device, what does um, success look like for, for Archer? Well, so as, as I pointed out in, in, in the talk, uh, at the moment, our entire development is really getting to the single qubit and gaining access to spins. Uh, so spins are the quantum mechanical property of particles associated with the carbon nanospheres that we're trying to gain access to. And so this device is designed to do exactly that. So 
essentially a first success is if we see, or a big success will be once we see these types of oscillations that we saw the same type, not on a bulk with trillions and trillions of those uh, quantum, uh, sorry, of those carbon nanospheres, but just on a single one, because this is really a key step towards making a working qubit based on single uh, uh, carbon nanospheres, or in other words, a single qubit. Excellent. And another um, just a quick question. Um, how is Arch Materials superior to other room temperature quantum devices like, uh, like diamonds? So, yeah, I just want to clearly say uh, there is uh, alternative offerings or uh, proposals on how to make room temperature uh, quantum computation uh, possible. So we really believe it's, it's a combination of things. So again, there's other ones that uh, have early demonstrations of their potential to allow for that at room temperature, but those are pretty much uh, all optics-based systems. And uh, the advantage that we have is that our material really allows, or our qubit architecture really allows for the easy integration with existing electronic devices that are based on silicon, that are based on uh, conducting devices within, uh, on a silicon chip. Excellent. Um, I'll go through some other questions. Do you think, um, this is one for both of you, do you think quantum encryption will be developed before the release of uh, consumer quantum computers? Um, do you want to start off, uh, Martin? <laughs> so quantum encryption. So yeah, I mean, quantum encryption as, as, uh, as a method, it is already developed, right? So that's definitely something you can already do in with photonics. And there's actually uh, people that have done that over very long distances. And there's, uh, so they that can either be in free space uh, using lasers or it can be done in, uh, in fiberglass cables. There's actually what they call the parliamentary, tri parliamentary triangle that they're building in, in Canberra. So secure communication using, uh, using quantum encryption is already possible now. So uh, yeah, in, in that sense, it's probably before a uh, you know, fully working uh, quantum computer. Yeah, and I'll add to that, um, there's this, this uh, fear maybe about um, quantum computers breaking standard cryptography uh, that's based on a proven algorithm called Shor's algorithm, which um, has been proven to be faster on a quantum computer. However, the quantum computer it relies on is something we call a, a fault tolerant quantum computer. And we're probably, you know, if we're talking 10 years to get commercial outcomes, we're probably 15, 20 years off having a quantum computer that can you run Shor's algorithm and actually um, crack modern encryption. Uh, and so in the meantime, we've already developed quantum safe cryptography methodologies that um, can be applied today. Uh, and in some of the IBM hardware in our, in our IBM mainframe that a lot of banks uh, use for doing their um, transaction processing, we already have that enabled. Uh, so so I, I think the, the, there's a sort of fear in the community um, about uh, quantum uh, computers breaking cryptography. I'd say we largely mitigated that already with these new developments and we're many years off um, a quantum computer that can, can get to that point. Excellent. And there's another question um, I received earlier via email. That's uh, essentially, it asks um, when the quantum chip the hardware is completed, uh, what are the crucial elements will there be to, required to be completed before the, um, the chip is fully operational? Um, did you want to answer that one, Adam? And then Martin, maybe you could comment also. Yeah, I mean, I'd say we, we've got um, uh, IBM's designed and we've built quantum computers that work today. We've got a, a working quantum chip. Um, it functions in the cloud. It runs thousands of experiments a day. Um, so we've demonstrated robust quantum computers that run in production at scale. We've also got a system that we designed called the IBM System 1, IBM Q System 1. And so this system is basically a fully modular quantum computer. Um, and as a part of that, we've integrated all, way, all the um, micro pulse out radi radiouts and um, cooling technology along with the chip into one uh, modular set of packages. And um, it's all in a, um, a hermetically sealed chamber. So that package is basically your first instance of a um, commercial grade quantum computer. And just by doing those things without changing the chip at all, we actually improve the quantum volume because we reduce the errors, we could control the environment much more and isolate all of the um, electronics from the actual quantum computer. Um, so I'd say we have real commercial quantum computers today. They're not as powerful or can not solve yet problems that a standard computer couldn't solve. 
um, but we have the technology to build all that together. So as we improve, that, that foundation's already there. Excellent, thanks Adam. Martin, did you wanna to add to that at all? Or? Yeah, I mean, so uh, at Archer, we're not quite as far yet down uh, our development, our hardware development, but of course we have a roadmap that sees us through all the way from the, um, from the, from the proven potential to a working prototype eventually. And so in terms of the question, I think was as to regarding the components. And I think um, when, when you look what the chip will look like, it won't look too dissimilar. If, if you look at it, it'll probably be a chip that's on the order of you know, a centimeter size and you, you have a substrate and you have uh, conducting wires in between that, uh, that deliver electronic uh, control voltages and, and signals to your qubit components. And you will have several of those qubits uh, in an array on a, on a surface. Uh, so the exact details, obviously, that's still part of the development, but the, the goal for now is really to make a, a one qubit device. And once we have that, to allow for, for single qubit operations, and then we uh, scale up and go, the next step would be uh, two qubit operations. And then, yeah, we scale up from that. Excellent. And I've, I've got a, a bigger question here for you, Martin. Um, with regard to Archer's 1-2 CQ chips under development at the moment, how long would their qubits maintain quantum coherence as compared to supercooled quantum computers that have been developed by IBM? Can you also compare the relative times required to process quantum logic gates? Essentially, it says, in a nutshell, can, you, can any theoretical estimates be given to compare the processing speed of Archer's 1-2 CQ chips as compared to their supercooled counterparts? Okay, well, that, that's a lot of questions in one question. Uh, let me break it down one by one. So as for the uh, coherence times, which is, is a very important measure on the way to, to uh, realizing a single qubit, that goes back directly to that graph, uh, that scientific looking graph with the oscillations that I shown you before. So at the moment in bulk, so on trillions of these, uh, we have already measured a number of a few hundred nanoseconds at room temperature. And if you now ask me how that compares to, for example, IBM's technology and uh, again, I'm just going to give a ballpark and then Adam can, can be more exact, but so those usually have a few tens of microseconds. So it's, it's a little bit longer. It's about 200, uh, 200 times, uh, sorry, two orders of magnitude longer. Um, but so this is the number we have. And again, ours is at room temperature. The important thing is that even though that's nanoseconds seems short, it's still much longer than a typical gate processing time now. So if we now come back to uh, gate times, um, I don't want to speak for Adam, but so usually for superconducting qubits, the gate operation times, it depends a little bit what type. So there's different types of gate operations and they have names like uh, uh, square root of swap or C naught control naught. They're usually on the order of tens of nanoseconds. Uh, so uh, again, I wish I could give you a definite number for our technology, but that's still something that's uh, in, in the future. So once uh, we once we reach that stage, we'll have a more accurate number for that. And the other thing I want to say regarding those 200 uh, or so nanoseconds that we measured already in bulk, I mean, that's uh, an as of yet unoptimized material. So there's no reason to believe that, you know, with uh, some tweaking of the materials properties, with some intelligent modeling and, and, and quantum chemistry, even that we couldn't extend that to, um, to longer times. Excellent. Did you want to comment on that one at all, Adam? Yeah, um, uh, all I'll say is that, um, as Martin said, um, it, it, or, or, or described, is that um, different technology has different properties. And we're at the early stage where there are many different technologies being developed and designed. And even our superconducting machines that we have, um, which we've got um, you know, six or seven different um, variants on our platform, have um, very, uh, very different gate errors, um, they have different kind of coherence times. So um, I'd encourage you, if you're interested in that sort of thing, jump on our platform. You can have a look at all the devices and um, get actually all of their uh, details. So you can get all of that single and two gate errors, the coherence times and things like that. So, um, and, and again, I think um, the different technology is going to bring different behaviors to um, how they run these algorithms. Um, and so, this is why we like an ecosystem that's open and that's hardware agnostic in, in many ways and why we're de developing our open source software like that is that so researchers can develop different hardware that has different behavior and can be used for different things. Excellent. Um, and there's another question here from an anonymous attendee. Is it expected 
that quantum computing will one day replace our current personal computing technology in personalized phones and computers, or will quantum remain for specialized uses only? Um, do you want to start off that, Martin, then maybe to Adam? Sure. So I think in, in the earlier days, or, or even now still, sometimes people call the near-term near machines, they call them hybrid devices. And I think it's even uh, Bob Sutor from, from IBM that points out it's, it's not a good term to use because if you're in the field, I think the belief is more uh, quantum will always, like any, any type of machine that you will run in the future, even if it's a fully fledged quantum computer, uh, you will always have a classical computer that controls uh, parts, parts of that. So I think what you will see is quantum enabled devices, uh, especially in the near term future, where you have classical and quantum uh, componentry or, or algorithms that run side by side. So I don't think a quantum uh, will, will completely phase out. There's not going to be a deadline where quantum completely phases out and makes all classical computations obsolete. So I don't, I don't see that any time in the near future. Yeah, and I, I'd agree with Martin on that one. I, I don't see that, that happening. I think um, our classical set of machines do everything we need them to do very well already. Um, and there'd be no benefit to, to replacing um, your laptop with a quantum uh, based laptop that so when you're typing up a word document and you hit the letter a you get a different result because it's probabilistic you don't want to type a and get a b or c or something so um i think i think yeah in the in uh, for the foreseeable future it's all going to be uh, a hybrid excellent i'll um i'll get to another question that was submitted earlier um what advantages will a quantum chip have on a, a phone and tablet if it is uh, integrated? I know this kind of touches on the previous question, um, rather than uh, you know your classical uh, phone phone now. Um, so I can I can start out with that. So uh, as Adam said, like classical computers are good at what they do. So it really comes down to a question of application. So not every application requires quantum. So there's two answers to this. So. Uh, the, the more direct one is that there is already applications uh, where it's not good enough to have access to quantum hardware in the cloud. And those are particularly ones that, that uh, address, uh, for example, secure communications. So it's cryptography uh, and, and uh, where you'd have something like a quantum random number generator that's something you can do with already a few qubits that could really help to in the future secure your communications between your device that could be for online banking or uh, transmitting uh, secure messages between your device and an external device or server. So obviously, uh, you're not going to have use for it. You're not going to do drug, uh, you know, complicated modeling of, of a new uh, molecule that doesn't need to happen on your phone. But there's definitely uh, applications on your phone, such as the one I just mentioned. And in, in addition to that, I think one of the exciting things and that may go a little bit further out is quantum algorithms are still being developed. So when, when the, the idea first came up in the 80s of quantum computation, people were like, yeah, that's cool. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a nice. Uh, I believe Martin may have lost uh, his internet connection there. <laughs> that's unfortunate. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully he can get back in. Um, Adam, do you have any comments? Are being developed. There's more applications. Oh. Sorry? Uh, your uh, your internet connection's a bit jumpy. Maybe just give it a couple of seconds, Martin. And then, um, Adam, did you want to yeah. comment on that one? I'll jump in. It, it's kind of similar to, I, I see um, where quantum on those types of devices would be useful is where we see, um, we think about edge use cases. You know, if um, you're doing some oil drilling, um, there might be AI solutions that you built that um, perform much better with a quantum chip than they do with a classical machine. Um, you need that in real time. You've got remote access. You couldn't necessarily use the cloud. That's that's an example of where you want something embedded in the device that you're using right there and then. Um, so that might be one. There may be applications where we use um, this type of technology in um, space exploration, where we can't have a delay of what we have. If it's if we've got some device or rover out on Mars, we can't have an, a 30, 40 minute delay or, or whatever. I think it's even more than that. So this is where these types of devices will be will be super useful. At least I just I on a funny note. At least in space, it's already so cold that you don't you don't have to cool it down quite as much. Like because it's already right. three degrees yes. Kelvin or something. So hard uh, the chip outside of the ship. Yeah, exactly. There's also a um, there's also a Samsung uh, Galaxy A, isn't there? There's a, a new phone out that um, 
so this has some quantum capabilities. Is that, mm. is that so, okay? Yeah, so that, that's got a, um, a security chip in it that does quantum safe, secure, uh, quantum safe cryptography. So this is what we were talking about before, how um, there's algorithms that are already quantum safe. So if you want to be hyper secure in what you have on your device and you want to leverage quantum based, uh, quantum safe encryption technology, that's one that will allow you to do that. Excellent. I know we're, um, we're running, running close on time here, so uh, let's uh, finish off with this question. Um, for maybe Adam first, um, what uh, milestones do you think IBM will be achieving over the perhaps the next, next 12 months, Adam? Yeah, so we're, we're on a, a, a pretty good trend. Um, we've been doubling quantum volume every year. Um, we just announced only last month that we'd gotten to a quantum volume of 64. Um, and that's on a, a 23 qubit machine. And so we're, we're on that trend of, of trying to, one, reduce the errors, make the current generation of qubits better, more high quality, as well as add, add um, more of these high, high quality qubits to our current generation of troops. So we see the, the trend for us is to continue on that pathway and then also to increase this open ecosystem around our Kiskit, Kiskit software stack, um, increase the community um, that's, that's using that, that set of tools and to drive users to, to leverage what we've built in the software world and, and to access and continue to develop on top of our um, superconducting qubit platform. Excellent. And uh, Martin, the same question, what, uh, what will uh, milestones when we can we can expect from Archer and also there's another question that I think that might be good for you Martin um, uh, what are some of the uh, competitors that are competing with Archer and how how is Archer um, better in comparison so well let me let me answer one at a time so as, as for the milestones I mean obviously we have commercial ones as well as technical ones I'm gonna just uh, speak for the technical ones so it really goes back to what I just said so the device I've shown uh, the, the next big milestone, we take one at a time. We have a concise roadmap that we follow. The next big one is really to gain access to these, uh, this quantum mechanical property called spin on individual carbon nanospheres, on, in other words, on an individual qubit. So in, in other words, uh, we're going towards a viable single qubit device um, where we can control, but also eventually read out the spin information that's stored on that. So in, in terms of technology, that's it. And so the other question was pertaining to the competitors. Um, who are you, and, yeah, who are your competitors and where are they at in comparison to, to the pursuit of quantum technology? Well, I guess we've already, I mean, uh, Adam has already given a, quite a broad overview. I mean, so there's, uh, there's you know, IBM does superconducting. There's also um, Eintrap-based uh, 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 qubits that are out there. I mean, there's, a, there's numerous other proposals. Um, it's probably going too far to put each one uh, into into their corner. I mean, our hardware development, we don't have a qubit quite yet, but we have other advantages. And that goes back to what I said in the talk. It really depends on your on your end user case. Uh, you know, if it's a stationary machinery, a piece of equipment that's bulky, or if it's a quantum enabled device that may one day be, one day be in a in a mobile and a portable device. Uh, what I do want to say though, there's. Uh, in, in that talk, uh, we put that in. There's an excellent report by BCG. It's 20 pages. It's it's a very uh, it's a very great. It, I mean, it's a it's a very deeply founded um, overview of the field in general. So you have all the the biggest contenders in qubits so far, and you have each their advantages and their, their drawbacks. So I think that's up a good summary. That that otherwise it go too far right now. I think to answer that. Excellent. Well, I think we um, we've gone over, but. Thank you very much for your questions, everyone. Now, I know there are numerous questions that we haven't had answered. Um, unfortunately, that's just the way things go. Um, thank you very much, um, Adam and Martin, for, for joining us this morning. And thank you for those tuning in. As I mentioned, we will send um, a recording of this webinar out to everyone who's registered to, to attend. And um, we may also send out some additional information, some additional reading. Um, thank you very much for joining us this morning. And I uh, hope you have a great day. Thanks, guys. Thank you. See you later. Thank you. Yeah.